Well, let's start with the obvious one, uh, passwords. Um, well, what's your password, Sean? I'm not going to tell you, but what I will tell you is I use a password manager to, to, to use, make it so that I don't really know my password. So actually, I don't know. I don't know what my password is. And, and I assume your password is randomly generated then? Randomly generated quite long, yeah. It's, it's quite long and it's randomly generated. And that's, that's a good way to have a password. Why? Because it has a lot of entropy. If you have a lot of equal combinations, the entropy is just the base two logarithm of the number of combinations. So obviously if you have, for example, a 15 character password with uh, regular letters, capital letters, numbers, special characters, you know, you have about 80, 90 different characters in your set to the power 15, that's going to be a massive number. Then you take the base two logarithm of it and you're still going to end up with a lot of entropy. In fact, we can take the base two logarithm, because we want to have our answer expressed in bits of the number of characters, which I said is roughly 80. And then there were 15 such characters. So that's 80 to the power 15. And if you do the math, uh, you can ask a calculator to do it, which I secretly have, and you get 95 bits, roughly. So is that, that's not 95 possible options, is it? That's 95 bits of... That's right. There are... 80 to the power 15 possible options, which, you know, as a guesstimate, I would say would be 10 to the power roughly 27, 28, a massive number of combinations. So if you want to search through all those combinations, you're not, you're not going to get there. Um, so you want the number of bits to be as high as possible. For every bit you increase your password entropy with, you double the number of searches that someone will need to do in order to guess your password. So you can imagine something like five bits entropy is nowhere near enough because that just means you need to do 32 guesses, two to the power five to guess the password, which is really easy in, in most settings. You know, this is a good way of doing it, but there's other ways of doing it. So there's a famous XKCD comic, which I'm sure everyone knows, which says you can select four sort of semi-random words. And I'm sure someone in the comments will correct me if I misremember it. Correct horse battery staple. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> A life correction. <laughs> and the argument there is that each word has a certain amount of entropy. So the whole string is massive, but it's not a random selection of, of characters. So we can't simply take 26 to the power, however many letters it has. But we can look at the entropy of individual words if you simply select them from the dictionary. So the claimed entropy of, of a word in the comic is roughly 11 bits. Uh, and then we get a much simpler computation. Uh, we have four words times 11 bits entropy each because they're independent for a total of roughly 44 bits of entropy. So selecting four random words, if you do it completely at random, would get you 44 bits of entropy, which by the way, is not even less than half the size. Every bit is halving the size. So while this is probably good enough in practice, it's unimaginably tiny compared to a properly randomly generated password that you don't have to remember. But there's another issue with the scheme uh, from XKCD, which is that you really, really need to make sure that your forwards are random. You can't, as a human, come up with forwards and, and put them in order because then we don't have a, a uniform probability distribution and that's actually really bad for the entropy. I don't want to go into too many details, but you can imagine that people doing word association are not going to come up with the same set of combinations as, as a computer would. It's going to be a more limited set and that's bad. It's going to reduce your entropy. If you hypothetically picked four words that were in the top 500. Then Mike Pound did a, a video on dictionary attacks, so I'm not going to go into the further details on that side, um, but I think it's interesting to note that the size of the dictionary correlate very nicely with information theory. So information theory here provides a very useful shortcut to thinking about dictionary attacks without actually having to deal with the nitty gritty details. There are other applications of uh, information theory um, in, in computer security. Uh, one obvious one would be privacy. Um, 
one way to express the privacy that you, you have is perhaps in the number of bits that are being leaked about you. So consider a case where we have a, a hospital with a database of patients. Now, it's valuable for research if researchers can access this information. Now, obviously, you don't want individual researchers to be able to query the database uh, and say, why did my aunt go to the hospital last week, right? So, obviously, you don't want researchers to be able to do that. They only need aggregate information. In other words, they can pull, for example, all patients with condition X and they would get a big list. Um, but rather than having individuals on them, it only has sort of aggregate information on them. So it will say, you know, they can query how many percent of uh, patients with condition X have condition Y. And then they will learn something about the condition, right? That's the goal. But they will also learn something about the patients at the hospital. Um, and this uses the notion of conditional entropy. We can see here we have a conditional query, so it's not surprising that we have a notion for that. So conditional entropy is written as the entropy of x given y. And you simply take the entropy of x for given outcomes of y, but then what are the outcomes of y? There's multiple possible outcomes. So you take the expectation. In other words, you're summing over all the possibilities of y um, and then taking the conditioned entropy, which is something slightly different, of the random variable x, where we know that y has some specific outcome. So we're looking at all the specific outcomes of y and we're taking the entropy of x in that case. It simplifies to the sum of the different values of y um, where we take the entropy of x in the case where y happens to be the case times the probability that y is the case. So we're just going through all the possible values of y saying what is the probability that we're in this situation and what is the entropy of x in that situation. We can further simplify the entropy uh, by applying the definition uh, but you're just going to end up with a long formula like here. Now this conditional entropy is very useful in, in measuring how much you know about the data set um, but there's also pitfalls. Let's go to the sort of cases that we want to capture um, with, with this conditional entropy. So let's say that ahead of time you don't know anything about the patients um, and now you learn somehow from the data set uh, that patient uh, a has condition X. Then what do you learn about patient A? Well, you learn a certain amount of bits. Um, and how many bits exactly depends on how common condition X is in the general population. So if it's a very common disease, the probability will be close to one bit. Um, if it's a very rare disease and you learn this, the, the information you learn will actually go, go up, right? And you can imagine if it's a one in a million disease, you learn quite a lot by learning that this patient has that particular uh, disease. And, and that's sort of how it's supposed to work. That's what we want. But you, there's odd cases. And in order to explain the odd case, I'm going to make an analogy uh, with dice, because humans are good at reasoning about dice. Um, so let's say that I throw four dice, die A, B, C and D. And I tell you that die A has a value four. How much did you learn about the data set? A quarter. A quarter, because it's one of four dice. That's not quite right. Um, <laughs> but it was close. I can why. see why. Um, no, what you learn is you basically reduce the total set of possibilities by a factor of six, right? Uh, if you don't know anything about the dice, how many possibilities are there? Well, six times six times six times six. Mm -hmm. The entropy of that, you just put a log two around it. And this is some number. Is log two because it's binary or is there another reason? Is there That's right. Um, so you could use any log you want. 
Uh, but we computer scientists love log2 because it gives you the answer in bits, and we like bits. Uh, you can use a natural log, you get your answer in nets. You can use at log10, then you're an engineer. Um, so the log2 of this number is about 10.3. But I told you the outcome of die 1. I told you the outcome was 4. Um, so that means that there isn't 6 times 6 times 6 combinations, there's 1 times 6 times 6 combinations. So we have 1 times 6 times 6 times 6, and we want to take the log 2 of that. But before we do that, let's talk about an interesting property of the log, which is that on the inside multiplication is addition on the outside. So this is the same as saying, well, the log 2 of 6 times 6 times 6 times 6 is actually equal to the log 2 of 6 plus the log 2 of the remaining ones, 6 times 6 times 6. These two values are, of course, the same, right? So we can actually look at each die individually. And that is because they are independent events. <laughs> it's your, what, 11.15 coffee? No, 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 it's, um, it turns off after a while and cleans itself. Oh, uh, okay. So these two log values are the same. Um, and this log value is just the base 2 logarithm of 6, which is uh, about 2.6 bits, if I'm not mistaken. So we can actually look at this formula and say, this is 2.6 bits. Uh, this is at 7.6 bit roughly, because I rounded the numbers, they don't quite add up to 10.3. Uh, but I assure you this is just due to rounding, which is exactly what is of interest here, right? Because here we get the log uh, to uh, base log 2 of 6 times 6 times 6 of the other three dice, uh, which was 7.6 bits. And then the difference between those two is how much we learned. So we take what we knew before, we take what we know after, so the entropy before the entropy after, the difference between that is how much we learned. So how much did we learn about this dice roll? 2.6 bits. Similarly, if we learn that a patient in the database has a particular disease, how much do we learn? Well, how many combinations were possible before for the entire data set? How many are possible after? The difference expressed in bits is how much you learned. This was the good case, but let's go to a case where it's less obvious that this is a good measure. So what if instead of telling you that die 1 had an outcome of 4, I told you that die 1 and die 2 had the same outcome? I'm not telling you what the outcome was, but I'm telling you that they are the same outcome. Okay, so what's the, what are the possibilities for die 1? There are six possibilities. What's the possibilities for die 2? Well, this is not independent of die 1, because I told you they're the same. So actually, there's only serious? one remaining possibility. 1 times 6 times 6. We take the log 2 of that number and we get again 7.6 bits. Which means that by telling you die 1 and 2 have the same outcome, you learn exactly the same amount about the data set as when I tell you the outcome of die 1. But in reality, that doesn't quite match what we want. Because if I tell you that patients A and B have the same disease, I would argue that you're not learning the same amount about anyone as when I tell you patient A has, I don't know, uh, a specific disease, right? Um, so these two are equal when it comes to entropy, but not equal when it comes to sort of what we feel is right about privacy. Um, still, I think this is a very useful application. Um, but we have to understand that just because you have a certain amount of information doesn't always mean that the information is useful. So it's one bit of surprisal. And similarly, if we plug in the double coin flip, your prediction, if I'm not mistaken, was heads and tails. Yeah. And the probability of that being right is of course easier one. to find what the factorization is. And then once you've factored it, you can just do these steps to completely recalculate the private key.